This morning, I want to talk about marriage and also singleness as well. And, and my title, my, my main thing this morning is pursuing holiness in singleness and marriage. Okay, pursuing holiness in singleness and, and in marriage. Mainly marriage, so touch on singleness as well. Uh, the journey of a Christian, uh, the process of our life, uh, it's called sanctification. That's, uh, it's, a, it's a fancy word that really describes what, what God has us on. Uh, he daily, he draws us closer to himself. And scriptures talk a lot about us pursuing holiness because it is in holiness that we really fulfill the plan of God to become like him in all the things that we are and all the things that we do. God's plan is that we mirror the image of Christ, whether it be in our family or individual lives, in our jobs, in our hobbies, in the things that we take pleasure and delight in. God's plan for our lives corporately as well, is that we mirror the image of Jesus in our lives. And Romans 8.29 says that uh, this is what we were predestined to do. For those whom God foreknew, He also predestined that they may conform into the image of His Son. So that's the big picture for a Christian. And as you grow in your holiness, uh, you start seeing transformation and change in character. You start seeing change in your aspiration, in your thoughts. What drives you begins to be what drove Christ. And you start seeing changes like for Jim, it was for them to go to India because once they became more gospel-centered and saw the need, uh, they couldn't stay the same. And I would encourage us to really take a deep look at our own hearts and kind of evaluate our progress in this journey of pursuing holiness. Is this something that we think about and pray about and never really move on? Or is there significant changes because we're pursuing holiness and to become more like Jesus? Uh, the Bible offers us different pictures of what, of what sanctification and holiness looks like. Uh, it's like two rivers. You know, Jesus Christ is this pure river. Then our lives are another river. I know we can't always be as perfect as Jesus because he was God and without sin and knew no sin and did no sin. Uh, but the idea is that our lives should not be contrasting. They shouldn't be going two different ways. Uh, they should be following the same path that Jesus has set for us. Another image in scripture about sanctification is of a piece of gold or silver that the silversmith leaves in the fire until it is refined. And most people say that a silversmith will leave uh, the metal or silver in the fire until he can take it out of the fire and look at himself. And until it mirrors his exact image, he will leave it in the fire. He will leave it through trials and tribulations until it is taken out. And the image he sees is of himself. And I think that speaks volumes about our journey. God leads us through trials and temptations and tribulations into the fire until our lives reflect more clearly daily the image of Jesus. So I think in marriage and in singleness, God provides us with unique opportunities, uh, with unique trials in themselves to grow in the likeness of Jesus, and I hope that that's the story of our life. Uh, let me talk to the singles. You know, there are some of us that are single and some of us that are married. Uh, the pursuit of holiness in, in singleness uh, really comes down to one question for me, and this has been my journey, and, and that sanctifying question for me is, is Christ enough for you? Okay, is Christ enough for you? Because honestly, if I were to take a good look at my whole life, there were many, many years and many, many seasons that I go through where I told myself that Christ was enough, but honestly, the way I lived, Christ wasn't enough. It was as if I needed something more and he wasn't fully satisfactory to me and it was insufficient for Christ to be all that I needed. So I would find other things or people or hobbies or addictions or something to, to sort of make up the lack. Okay, I have Jesus here, I have my faith here, uh, but there is still room in my life for something else. And so because Christ isn't fully enough for me, both theoretically and practically, uh, there are other things that come into play. And, and so that's something we have to ask ourselves, single guys and, and women, is Christ truly enough for us? And the more honestly and the more consistently we can answer that question with yes, He is enough, 
we're cultivating and growing in our holiness. Sometimes we feel a sense of dissatisfaction or incompleteness with just having Christ in our life. And we say, well, there has to be more. There has to be something else that should be added for me to enjoy the fullness of life, for me to be complete, for me to have this pursuit of, of being all that I'm supposed to be. There has to be something more. And we search for these things constantly. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 I love this verse, and it speaks into this topic. It says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is ahead over every power and authority. Okay, so the fullness of deity lives in Christ, and in Christ our fullness is given. All that we are, all that we that we ascribe to be in Christ, the fullness of that is found. In Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about the church and it says that the fullness of Christ fills all in all. Everything in every way, Christ fills that. And so if we're struggling with the thought of, am I enough just be me, with me and Jesus? And the answer is yes. The fullness of your life, the fullness of all you are and all you are to be is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. I realize sometimes in the, in the, in the singleness of our life, uh, some of the temptations that we face with are incompleteness. Uh, sometimes we're just simply bored, so boredom. Uh, sometimes we are lonely and need companionship. Sometimes uh, we lack, you know, sexual pleasure, and so we think marriage is a solution to that. Uh, sometimes opinions of others, okay, they're telling me I've got to do this and be with this person or get married quickly because uh, it's not because it, it, it's odd for me to be the only one that's not married. Uh, sometimes the question of am I not good enough for somebody? Uh, am I not wanted by anybody? Those are temptations uh, that we constantly deal with in our singleness. Incompleteness, insufficiencies, or lonely, or bored, or having nothing to do. Uh, but I, I think there are solutions in Scripture for those temptations in our singleness. Uh, in the sense of incompleteness, we've talked about this, it's you find fullness and completeness in Jesus alone. In boredom, there's just one person I want to talk, tell you, Apostle Paul. I mean, he was single, but he wasn't bored. He didn't have nothing to do. I mean, you look at this guy who took advantage of the fact that he was single and he was alone, and he changed the world he lived in, planted more churches than anybody we know, wrote more scriptures than anyone we know. And, and so that's not an excuse to say, well, I don't have anything to do. There are plenty of things in the world that are waiting for you, and your singleness is really a beneficial thing for you to fully engage in being agents of the truth and being agents of transformative power. And so use the time you have for the benefit of the world and the progression of the gospel. Uh, if you're feeling lonely and that's your biggest temptation, I encourage you to really find deep friendship with God and a community of people. You know, God offers us a solution for loneliness and that's why we were created so that we would have this companionship and this friendship with God, and so if we're feeling lonely and inadequate, God says, okay, just enjoy this pleasure of being my friend. If it's a lack of pleasure or sexual pleasure that we're waiting for marriage or something, uh, then we're deifying a gift, and we're making it into an idol. That's really the reality of it. The opinions of others, and that's what bases our choice of marriage, and we're not trusting God and God's plan for us. So I encourage you to find full trust and confidence in what God has for your life. The question of am I not good enough that plagues us at night, I encourage you to find your value and worth in God. Knowing that God shed His blood for you, that God has been pursuing you all your life. And so I think God sees value in you. God sees a reason for Him loving you. And so if it's a question of in, inadequacy or insufficiency, just look at the pursuit of God for your life that adds value like no one else. Ephesians 1 talks about him, you know, foreknowing you and having chosen you before the foundations of the earth were laid. That speaks volumes on your worth and your value. In summary, uh, in singleness, Christ becomes your everything, your total satisfaction, and all that you would long for in a spouse you find in Christ. 
all that you would want, all that your deepest longings for marriage and in a spouse, you find that in Christ. Friendship, companionship, love. All of these things are found in Christ. So in your singleness, the pursuit of holiness is answering the question, is Christ, is he enough for me? And I pray that the Holy Spirit works in your heart and in your life to where Christ becomes enough. Maybe marriage is ahead of you, and that's great. If it's not, God still has a plan for you, and he still wants to be enough. Even when you enter marriage, God still wants to be enough in your life. So holiness in marriage, and, and for us to talk about this, uh, we, we can't do it without reading Ephesians 5, uh, 24 to 30, 33. So if you could turn there, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24 onwards, and this was read at the wedding yesterday. And so if you were at the wedding yesterday, you would have probably heard some of this as well. Ephesians chapter 5 says it like this in verse 24. Uh, actually, we'll start at 25. Actually, 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. That's what I want you to pay attention to, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that, the, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Uh, the two things that I want to just bring out of this passage that we read in our discussion of pursuing holiness in marriage um, is that this scripture seems to say that in the way that a husband life loves his wife, he makes her holy. Because Jesus sanctified the church by laying his life down for the church. So in the same way, husbands, love your wife with the end result that your love for your spouse sanctifies your spouse. So husbands, you are God's agent to bring holiness and sanctification to your wife. And wives, the husband is your agent that God has placed in your life to sanctify you and to make you a better image bearer of Christ himself. In the book Sacred Marriage, uh, which is a great phenomenal book, and if you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it, uh, Gary Thompson asked this question. He says, what if God designed marriage to make us holy rather than happy? Okay, what if God's purpose in marriage is to make us holy rather than just happy? And I think that's so true because as I've seen marriages and families come together, knowing somebody before they were married and looking at their lives after they were married, it's a complete different picture of that person because marriage has done something to them. You can't help but be changed. I know there's some newlyweds here, so you're probably experiencing the beginning days of how it purifies you. Because we're all selfish in our nature. We want our way when we want it, how we want it. We want to do things our way, and we are individuals before marriage. But when we enter into marriage, uh, the two become one. And so our carnal nature of selfishness and self-gratification and self-protection is now threatened. It's now defeated by selflessness. And caring for the other person as you have now become not two autonomous persons, but one person. And that's the beauty of marriage because it reveals our sin so that we might hate it and repent of it. It reveals us things in our carnal nature and marriage does that in an incredible way so that we can deal with it and see how it's contrasting against the nature of Christ and then repent and deal with it. So in the way that you love your spouse, in your journey, in your marriage, it sanctifies us, it purifies us. Happiness is there, and it's incredible, but the ultimate purpose of marriage is to purify each other. 
So the way you are selfless, the way you forgive, the way you are generous, the way you uphold purity, and the way you deepen each other's relationship with God is a way of God purifying us to Himself and to each other. But don't we in most marriages today, in our culture, in the media, don't we place happiness as the greatest alternative? Uh, don't we place happiness as the greatest goal that a marriage is longing for, that is headed towards? And so, I mean, just think about the normal pursuits of a, an ordinary marriage. And right after the marriage, we have to have the nicest honeymoon spot with the greatest, uh, the re- greatest you know, the weather and everything provided. Because if we have a better honeymoon experience, uh, then we are happier people. When we look for the nicer house than normal people or, or a bigger house because we believe that that will make us happier. And we, you know, when we have a child, we hope that this child is perfect and weighs this many ounces or is this tall and has this kind of a hair or this kind of a eyes because if it is the perfect baby, it makes us happier. We live in a perfectly gated community because the more secure we feel, the more protected we feel, the more happier it makes us. I mean, the more finances, the better jobs, the happier we are, the security at work. When our kids get older, you know, the better colleges they go to, the better professions they become make us happier. And our 401k plan, the greater it is, the more secure it is, it makes us happier. And we pass on the same trend to our children. Bigger is better. It makes you happier. Anytime we lose happiness in any of these things, we change. So as soon as your job stops making you happy, uh, you quit and find another one. As soon as a career path is no longer making you happy, uh, we shift from that to another one. As soon as a house or a neighborhood is no longer making us happy, we quickly find something that makes us happier. And the same is most often applied to marriages and couples. As soon as there is a drop in happiness, We look to quickly get out of that marriage and to change our spouse and to end the covenant for something that would make us more happier. Imagine if holiness was the ultimate pursuit in our marriages. Imagine instead of trying to make ourselves the happiest we could ever be and the most convenient we could ever be, if we looked at marriage and our family, okay, how can I become more holy through the circumstance that I am in? I believe we would respond to our life in such drastic different ways. So instead of looking at trials and tribulations and inconveniences uh, as something that destroys us, we would receive it with joy, like James says, that our trials would be received and embraced with joy. Our sacrifices would become joyful because it lifts us up into a better picture of Christ. It moves us further along our journey into holiness and into becoming like Jesus is empowered by the Spirit, but the practical steps are taken by the individuals. And one thing uh, I've realized about holiness that it's that it cannot be uh, just passively maintained. It has to be actively pursued. Because we look at holiness as, okay, I, I can do all of these things. I can have these things and possessions, and I can make my life happy as long as I keep the, the normal Ten Commandments or a moral conduct. I can have my way of life and still keep holiness on the side. And we try to maintain holiness, but that's not the case because every day our sinful flesh, it wants to take us away from holiness into carnality. So it has to be this active pursuit daily, intentionally saying, okay, how can I become more holier unto Christ today? How can our family look like Christ in a better way today? What decisions can we make? What choices must we make in the future that draws us to Christ closer, even if it inconveniences our life. When we read Ephesians 5, the purpose of marriage seems to be clear. It's to make us holy, to make us more and more like Christ, and thus magnify Christ in a greater degree in our sojourn on earth. As a follower of Christ, God has graced us with a spouse to reveal our own selfishness, to our, our own nature of self-satisfaction, and to repent of it that we might become like Jesus, saying, um, Paul, the, the Pope Paul uh, the Sixth said that marriage is a long path towards sanctification. Marriage is a long path, and that's so true. It's a lifelong, long journey. 
It doesn't end when you reach your first 10 years of marriage. It, it doesn't end when you have your kids or they go off to college. It's a lifelong, long path to holiness. So the other thing that I want us to note from our reading of this passage in Ephesians 5 is that, okay, this union between a husband and a wife is a picture of a greater reality. So marriage uh, is a lens for us to see this amazing mystery, as Paul says it, and this mystery is the union between Christ and the church. Uh, that's the big picture, that's the ultimate reality uh, that Paul wants us to be mindful of. Okay, the union between Christ and the church is the greatest thing in the world, and all of scripture talks about this union. I mean, God created us for fellowship, and when sin happened, there was a disruption in our fellowship, and God is pursuing this union through Christ Jesus and establishes this union. He, he perseveres and sustains this union. He fulfills this union so that at the eschatos, in the end of our days, we're actually in better places than we were at creation because a union with God that is unbreakable has now been established. So that's the big picture. That's what we're all living in. And we're headed towards the fulfillment of the union between Christ and the church. But marriage is a small, maybe imperfect, but it's the closest we have a picture of that union. It shows us a display, a small mirror of that union in a small way on earth. So it leads us to that. It is a lens that we can look at this greater reality. Because when this reality is fulfilled, it is fully done, then there is no need for marriage. And the Bible says that after the resurrection, uh, there would not be anyone given to marriage or receiving marriage because the reality that marriage points to has been fulfilled. But on earth, marriage is the picture we have that speaks of this union. And so it's a pretty serious deal because this union is amazing it's a great deal and if marriage between a husband and a wife between a man and a woman is to be the display of that then we should take marriage really really seriously then we should look at marriage okay i've got to let my marriage or your marriage be the most clearest depiction of this union as it possibly can be and so it's no longer about us or our spouses. It's about God and the union between Christ and the church. And the more we reflect on that union and we use our marriage for the world to look through into that union, then it does a whole new thing in your marriage itself. It begins to purify your marriage. It begins to draw your marriage into what is supposed to be holy and pure unto God. And so if... The ultimate reality is this union between Jesus and the church. And if marriage is to be a picture of that, I think us looking and reflecting on how God establishes and sustains this ultimate reality should influence the picture that we live in and through marriage. So this reality, this ultimate reality speaks of unconditional love and Forgiveness and sacrifice in the greatest degree of generosity. It's the gospel and the grace and mercy that he has shown. And, and that's the ultimate reality that marriage is supposed to depict. And so the Bible is filled with passages and parameters that establish this union between God and the church. So if marriage, if our earthly marriages are supposed to depict that, uh, shouldn't at least the parameters that are surrounding the union between God and the church relatively at least be the parameters that govern our marriage. Should the instructions in scripture that talk about this, these parameters or instructions that, that, that establish this union between God and the church, shouldn't that be also maybe used in our marriage to at least some extent? I think if the parameters of the ultimate reality, which is God and the church becoming one, are relatively applied to marriage, this picture of marriage reflects more pure the ultimate reality, God and the church as one. I know that at Loft, you guys have been talking about the seven churches in Asia Minor through Revelations 2 and 3, and, and these churches are the bodies of Christ. And, 
and God in these passages draws them closer in their holiness, in their sanctification. God, through these warnings and these letters, is drawing his church closer to himself into a better picture of a union between God and the church. And he calls out the broken parameters. He calls out the boundaries that have been crossed that now harm or endanger uh, this union. And so I wonder if, if God is saying to these seven churches these instructions for them to participate in the union of Jesus and the church in a, in a better, purer way. What if we translated those instructions into our own marriage life that is supposed to depict the ultimate reality, the union of Christ and church. And if we said, okay, these parameters that God calls for, these change and transformation in the church, okay, it also applies to our own personal marriage life in the union between a husband and a wife. If we use those same parameters for our living, I think we pursue holiness. So for instance, in the church of Ephesus, you know, uh, Jesus says, okay, I know your works, your good deeds, your perseverance, but you've lost your first love. So the instruction then is to return and to repent and to remember the first love that this church had for Jesus. And so I think as we translate that into the marriage picture, we must avoid the temptation to make each other the greatest love of our life. Because that's so easy to do in marriage. We deify our spouse and place them as the, as the number one priority and God loses his place of first love. That's a common temptation for us to have. But God says, okay, in this union in marriage, let me be the first love. So secondarily, on earth, your spouse is supposed to be your greatest love. It is supposed to be your first love. But as we go through our journey on earth, we become busy and get attached to jobs and things. As children are born, we give them love and attention and resources. And so it's even possible that on earth, while the spouses are supposed to be uh, their first love on earth, we share that first love with other things on this earth. And God says, okay, just as I am your first love as God and King, your spouses are to be the ultimate places of love on earth as I've designed it to be. Sometimes uh, we say, well, our, our beginning days of marriage are over and we've matured to an extent where my wife isn't receiving the same love that she once did or my husband isn't receiving the same love, but I encourage you in your pursuit of holiness to become first lovers of God and then lovers of each other all over again. To the church in Smyrna, God says, okay, continue being faithful. And that's something that can easily be translated into our marriage and our pursuit of holiness, to be faithful and let faithfulness have its rightful place and to, and to nourish this and to continue to work towards this. For the church in uh, Pergamum, you know, God says, okay, remain true to my name. But the issue with them was they held on to the teachings of Balaam. If you know the story of Balaam in Numbers, uh, they, Balaam was called by King Balak because he wanted to have a word of curse from God so that Israelites would be cursed. And, but God wouldn't curse the Israelites through Balaam and through his donkey. God kept speaking words of blessings. And King Balak had offered a bribe. Say, okay, if you just cursed your people, if you curse God's people, I'll give you something. But Balaam couldn't curse God's people people. So Balaam set this up. Okay, he said, okay, King Balak, if you just provide a, a festival, a pagan feast, and you supply women and wine, surely the children of Israel will sin, and then God will curse them. So he says, okay, I, I can't do this with a clean heart, and so you provide so that I can still get my bribe, so I can still get the money that you have offered me, and then God will curse. Balaam manipulated the situation for the endangerment of God's people. Don't we also at times in our marriages or conversations and decisions manipulate a certain few things for our own selfishness and self-gain? God calls us to repent of the teachings of Balaam and to really return to a selflessness, even if it means an inconvenience on my part. In my marriage, we uphold the purity of faithfulness and selflessness. 
Then it talks about the Nicolaitans who, uh, who were committed to Christ. They were Christians, but they were indifferent about the commands of God or adultery or immorality. So they were convenient, committed people of God. Sometimes in our marriage also we are tempted to be conveniently committed. As long as it's good for me, as long as it keeps things running smoothly, I'll be committed. But a convenient commitment is really no commitment at all. And our marriages may we uphold commitment and our covenant no matter the cost, no matter how inconvenient it might be. To the church in Thyatira, you know, the issue there was they tolerated Jezebel and immorality, sexual immorality. Easily translated into our marriage, are there immoral thoughts even, motivations or mindsets that we carry into marriage? And God's calling for the repentance of that. It could be even disengaged emotionally from your spouse and it's now unpleasing to God. God has come to a true moralness in our marriage. To the church in, in Sardis, the command here is to strengthen what remains and is about to die. Really to encourage what is going on and to remember what they've received and to heard and obey it and continue to encourage one another. Uh, in our marriages, are you building each other up? Is there a building that's happening inside of your marriage? Are we lifting and encouraging husbands intentionally leading your wives spiritually, emotionally? Women or wives respectfully, you know, living to make your home the best place it can be. And understanding the God-given role in marriage and affirming your husband's role and us together building each other up in marriage. To the church in Philadelphia, the idea is to hold on to what you have. And I would encourage marriage folks in here to celebrate what is working so that you continue to cultivate and nourish the good things because we can get so caught up on what is not working or what we're missing that we forget what we do have. And so to build that up and to cultivate and to celebrate the things that are working. To the church of Laodicea, it's meant to be a lukewarm church, not hot or cold. And God says, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. When you translate that into marriage, is there indifference about the things that really matter the most? Is there an in indifference or is there apathy or I don't really care what happens to the things that matter the most? And God says, okay, no, they can't, there's no room for indifference when it comes to certain things. You've got to have your minds made up. There's a, there's a phrase that uh, sacred marriage uses. It's called falling forward. So in the midst of trials and in the midst of you know, arguments, we can easily fall back and disconnect and get into indifference or apathy, but it encourages us to fall forward, to let your trials, to let problems in life push you further along in your journey. This is what he says, to stop moving toward our spouse is to stop loving him or her. It's holding back from the very purpose of marriage. The opposite of biblical love isn't hate, it's apathy to be lukewarm, to be indifferent about the things that really matter the most. Is God the centerpiece? Is He the drive of your marriage? Do you feel a need for God every day or have we just kind of gone along with our normal daily lives and don't really have the need for God's empowerment in our marriage? You know, the cool thing about all of these instructions is that what God requires to these churches, He's already provided. What God is calling for in our marriage, He's already given. So He's calling for first love when He's already given the ultimate love He possibly could. He's calling for faithfulness when He has been committed and faithful to us. And uh, the basis of applying these instructions to the church, to our own lives, and to our marriages is to reflect on how all of that has already been given in Christ to us. And that becomes the ground, the basis on how we build healthy, holy, sanctified marriages. So in conclusion, uh, for singles and married, the question that I want to ask you and for you to really struggle, deal with in your own lives to cultivate holiness, it should never be how far can I go before I do something wrong or how far can I go before it's a sin, but let it be how can I as a single man or a woman, how can I as a husband or a wife in my marriage, how can I love abundantly God and please God more and more? How can we together 
and our spouse abundantly love Christ more and more and please Him more and more. Because then it takes the focus off of us and places it back on the glory of God. How do we glorify God more? How do we love Jesus more? And that drives us into holiness. I heard it once said that holiness really isn't a rule of things to do and don't do, but it's really having so much love in your heart towards God that it leaves no room for anything else. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says it like this in verse 1. Finally, brothers, we instruct you how to live in order to please God as in fact you are leaving, are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. Ask yourself, how do I please God more? How do I abundantly love God more as a single or as a married person? How do I love God more? And then everything else starts to fall in place as God becomes the most glorified person in your marriage. As I close and the worship team can come forward, when I think about marriage and just how it sanctifies you and how it makes you holy, uh, the first couple or the first family that comes to mind, you guys might know this family is Santosh and Susan from Tennessee. Santosh and Susan Matthews. Uh, Susan, and this story is an incredible story of struggles and trials, but how God has sustained them and purified them through this whole journey. Susan was born and brought up here, but she went to India because she felt the Lord called her to India to get married, and she married Santosh. It took him two and a half years, longer than that, for them to have their visas resolved and for him to come to America. Imagine being married for two and a half years and not being able to live with your, hus your husband. So that in, in itself was trying for that family, living apart for years. Then he finally gets over here, and there's so many issues with jobs and things, and, and they finally have their first boy, Philip. Something they're excited about, something that they've been looking forward to. This is great, this will make us fulfilled and happy in our marriage. They go for a scan to check Philip out, and the doctor says he's not going to be born alive. He doesn't have a stomach. He has lungs that are just just so too close together they can't develop. There are holes in his heart. There's no chance for this baby to be born alive. A whole side of his body is not even forming. He doesn't have a left ear or a left eye. These things are serious and the baby will surely not be born alive. So the best option is to abort it so that it doesn't also endanger the life of the mother. Imagine a couple waiting for a family so long now has been told this news of no hope. No chance of life. Struggling with the idea of what do we do now? But they found faith in God's word and the community of believers. They had the child. This is a picture of Philip when he was born. Miraculously, he was born. God started working in the midst of misery. But he wasn't born as a perfect baby. Had a lot of issues. Still had no ear in his left side or an eye or a jawline. Cleft palate, cleft lip, all these issues in his heart with holes that couldn't breathe properly, they couldn't feed him through the mouth for months. But they pressed in. You know what? Yeah, this may not be the happiest day of our lives. This may bring suffering and pain to see our firstborn and our only child live like this for the rest of our life. But we're in this. It's a covenant. We're going to be faithful to God's calling. Life of Philip is a huge testimony of life amidst darkness. He's gone through more surgeries that I can't even count on my fingers and toes. Surgeries after surgeries. And it did a huge work in the life of Santosh and Susan. They were our youth leaders, they were our youth pastors committed to the work of God. They had every reason to quit and leave and pursue convenience, but they stayed in. Sometimes quit his job and he felt called to start a nonprofit organization. So imagine having all these medical issues and only one income coming in. That was a huge struggle. Having to risk their house on foreclosure. Having to hear the opinions of others saying, hey, you should do this. It'll be the best for you. But then having the voice of God inside of you calling you to earth holiness. This marriage has completely changed along their struggle. I mean... This is all the things that were wrong with their firstborn. That in itself is huge. This is Philip today. He still has his own daily struggles, his own issues. But through life, through the life of Philip, their parents were sanctified. 
through the life of Philip and through this journey, the community of believers were moved towards holiness and says, okay, even if we're not the happiest people on earth, if we can glorify God better through this circumstance and portray the picture of Christ and long suffering and sacrifice and unconditional love, if this particular situation can help us do that better, then there's no greater thing for us to ask. Pursuing holiness over happiness over convenience, pursuing commitment to the relationship, even when the commitment to the person is struggling. That's what God's call us. Would you stand on your feet this morning? Whether you're single or married, God is drawing the church together into holiness through trials, through suffering, through pain and agony, through inconveniences. It's our destiny. It's what we're destined to do. As we enter into Holy Communion and the Lord's Supper, this is our point of reference. For marriage, for singleness, here we found the greatest generosity, the greatest sacrifice, the greatest selflessness, the greatest inconveniencing of oneself to the nth degree so that this establishment, this union between God and the church could be real. That's the ultimate, that's the big picture. And it's been done for us. The price has been paid, the sacrifice has been laid. And the incredible, joyful opportunity in life to show this world a small picture of that through your marriage. That's amazing. Yes, sure, marriage may limit what you can do, but it multiplies what you become. There may be restrictions on the things we can do, but the things, the people that we become is intensified. So as you take the Lord's Supper this morning, reflect on Jesus and the person of Christ in your marriage, in your singleness, that is truly sufficient. That is enough more than what words could say. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, as we come to the Lord's table, you're calling us towards you. You're calling our characters, our aspirations, our goals towards you towards your plan for the world. And on the cross of Christ, on Calvary, we find our reference point for our lives. May we live like you lived. May we die like you died. May we treat our spouses as you treated the church. May we embrace our singleness as you embraced yours, as Paul embraced his. It's a call of God to make the most of the season that we're given so that the world may know who you are. So we submit to your word, we submit to your presence here. Be thou glorified and draw us closer to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray.